Good day, everyone. And I want to say a happy Air Traffic Controllers Day to all my Air Traffic Control colleagues. My name is Amy Charles, and I happen to be the manager of Air Traffic Services in St. Lucia. With me are my colleagues, Kendall Peter to my left, who is a supervisor of Air Traffic Control at UANORA. And to my right, it's a longtime veteran of air traffic control who now serves in the capacity of the air side oper operations uh, manager, duty manager at UANORA. So, in, in effect, we are celebrating the 59th anniversary of Air Traffic Controllers Day because Air Traffic Controllers Association, the International Federation of Air Traffic Controllers Association, was founded in 1961. And so 59 years later, we are, we are here. We know our profession is one that not many people are aware of because it's pretty much a behind the scenes operation. And so without further ado, we will have continue and we hope that you will enjoy the session with us for the next hour or so for us to talk about air traffic control in all its forms and, it's, and, and also its sister organizations in terms of aeronautical information services. Also, we have aeronautical project officers. So it's a very interesting field in terms of air traffic management as a whole. I think I'll probably switch to Len, who knows so much about air traffic control, who loves air traffic control, notwithstanding the fact that he has almost like retired from our section of, of the service and he's now doing the, the air side management of the planes. Your memories of air traffic control, um, Len? Morning again, everyone, and thank you, Amy. Yes, mm -hmm. um, indeed. I have quite a few memories of air traffic control and um, the years that I served as an active air traffic controller was indeed one that I did with pride and um, it's a job that requires a great amount of responsibility on the, each individual but what's more important is that each individual has to work with another individual making us one team so in, in sort of a team setting if you have a weak link then naturally it affects the team and um, in terms of memories, I suppose as we go along, I, I can share a few here and there, but um, I have had a few, you know, not a few, quite a, I would say quite a number of good memories, both with regional pilots and, and, and international pilots. And um, sometimes it allows us to recognize that we are all individuals, except that we are in different professions. So some persons may believe, you know, that probably the pilot is the more important person in the aviation scheme of things where pilot controller is concerned but actually the controller is equally even more important because whilst the controller or rather whilst the pilot is responsible for his single aircraft the controller is responsible for his aircraft and also the the other aircraft that are in the airspace or on the ground at any given time so hence for me um, you cannot underestimate the importance and the responsibility of an air traffic controller as it is in this profession but like I say, as we go along, I mean, if them when when you, the bits come up, I can, you know, let you know some of the things that have happened over the years with us as air traffic controllers. Yes. Okay, so Kendall, to you, you're not only a supervisor of air traffic control at UNRA, you also happen to be the president of the Air Traffic Controllers Association. So give us your take on what air traffic control means to you and just about the business of air traffic control. Well, certainly, I know um, in this time that while we are always sort of in the background, uh, maybe the public does not necessarily know much about our jobs and what we do. I think it's important as an air traffic controller and as the president of the St. Lucia Air Traffic Controllers Association, who is sort of charged with uh, promoting awareness of what we do, that I say that, um, you know, we are professionals. It is the, the theme for this year. Um, we are professionals. We've always been professionals. Certainly, in this pandemic, uh, we have been here to support all the repatriation flights, all the, the cargo flights, all the medical flights that have come into St. Lucia. And I want to ensure the public that the way we work as controllers, professionalism is definitely one of the hallmarks of the profession. Everything we do is guided by international standards and recommended practices that come all the way down from the International Civil Aviation Authority down through ECA and our own local um, Ministry of Civil Aviation and of course LASPA as the navigation provider, we set our, we make sure that all of our procedures and resources are to that level to ensure that safety is not compromised. So 
I think it's important on this day as any to say that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. In terms of uh, my own history, I became an air traffic controller. Um, it wouldn't be 1986. You don't be. I, I finished air traffic control school in 1985. However, you don't become an air traffic controller until you have actually succeeded your on-the-job um, validation. And in terms of your training as um, with a, a senior controller on the job, so I would say I would date myself back to. I remember April first, all Fool's Day of 1986, but it has not been a fool's job at all. I totally and thoroughly enjoyed um, this job. And, um, and to Kendall's point, uh, the professionalism that was required, the autonomy, and at the same time, you have to have the teamwork. You could be independent, but you must also work within a team and support the team and support the team from a point of view of two airports. Because you work at UNR, you work at George Charles, and we have to work together and trust each other. Because George Charles is not seeing what's happening at UNR, but they have to trust the air traffic controller from UNR and vice versa. Because UNR, in um, the case of St. Lucia, happens to be the parent station. And we talk about two different types of air traffic control, which is approach control, and that is aircraft approaching the facility for both airports, which UNR takes care of, and then you deal with aerodrome control, which you are, both UNR and George Charles do. So the, the airspace for George Charles would be lo uh, lower airspace, uh, but UNR um, goes higher and is the daddy, so to speak, of air traffic control in St. Lucia. So it has been a very, I am no longer an active air traffic controller. I am more into the administration of air traffic control, but it still remains very, very dear to my heart. And um, my colleagues remain dear to my heart. And we still every day, because air traffic control is about every day that something can change. So this job is nonstop, especially even for the persons in management, because it's like 24 seven because you you, um, you never know when you get that call. Somebody needs something special. Somebody needs um, um, some attention, uh, an extra flight that needs to happen. Somebody needs to be evacuated because of a medical condition. And it's always on the go and you must always be ready. And so air traffic controllers have to be also a fit in terms of mental fitness as well as physical fitness. As a matter of fact, um, we are in the process of carrying out our medicals and um, that medical has to be carried out by a licensed aviation specialist who is going to be brought in from Antigua because we don't have one on island. It is that significant. It's the same um, medical license that the pilots do. So this is a significant job and the persons in that job um, deserve the respect and, and pretty much I suppose good, uh, no news is good news. So people don't hear anything, so that means things are going well. Uh, but, but you don't want to hear bad news in air traffic control at all. <laughs> yes. I don't know if anybody in our audience would like to ask any questions. So we would be um, very willing um, to answer. Otherwise, we just, we'll just continue the conversation. One of the main questions is, what does it take to become an air traffic controller? Okay. Okay, um, Okay. the question is, what does it take to become an air traffic controller? Len, I will pass that on to you. All right, so I think in the first instance, I mean, from a, an academic standpoint, you obviously need to have maths, English, geography, and some science subjects. But um, that is, I mean, the baseline to get into, the, to be able to start the profession. But even beyond that now, once you have successfully gotten into the profession, it requires a great amount of discipline, a sense of responsibility, because the job that you do, you literally have the lives, the lives and the livelihoods of persons in your hands. Um, it is a job that requires you to be a quick planner, a quick decision maker. So in other words, it's not one of those jobs where you can say, okay, I'm looking for a job. It, you have to be passionate about what you're about to do, because otherwise you would quickly realize that the stresses that comes along with air traffic control and I kid you not there are stresses at times because you could have a shift of six hours and the first two hours are pretty light and the next four hours are extremely heavy so you have to prepare yourself mentally to be able to deal with that kind of pressure so if you know from the onset that's not the challenge that you want to give yourself I would gladly suggest to you 
do not enter the field of air traffic control. Not that I'm trying to discriminate, I mean, discourage persons, but all I'm saying it is a job, especially in those modern days that we live in, and ever so often the technology is changing, there are new things that we have to learn, and as such you have to remain also current with whatever rating that you have within air traffic control. Because every air traffic controller, before you be actually become air traffic controller, you need to go to a school, a specialized school. In the first world countries like the United States and, and Europe, it takes as much as maybe two and a half to three years to get properly qualified. In the Caribbean, it's somewhere anywhere between eight to eight months to a year, give and take. But when you get back into your country, you still have to go through a process of validation and proficiency checks to be able to work within your local environment. Okay. I think one of the, uh, the interesting things about a job is that it's a job that you always grow into. When you come out of school as a, a cadet, as we say, mm -hmm. you're not a controller. No. And a year later, you'll be a better controller. A year later from that, you'll be a better controller. It's something that experience always makes you a better controller. As long as you, because no two days in ATC are the same as we always say. Yeah. And it's a very dynamic profession, and you always sort of build your capacity as a, a problem solver, as a as a communicator, as a, as a team player. So yeah, it's, it's an interesting field. To, to and and I and I must say, um, there is the aspect of um, customer service. Whilst it may appear to be robust and and you in the tower, but I can tell you, there is a customer service component to it because at the end of the day. The pilot, who is your your the, your client, so to speak, needs to know that he can feel confident in knowing that the person who's dispensing the instructions to him is not doing it in a, in a dogmatic way, but in a way that is there's empathy depending on the situation. But in the same in the same manner, you must remain in control as the air traffic controller. And I mean, I I remember when the whole thing of customer service in Slasper was coming into play. I remember an incident that happened, not an incident actually, a situation that happened to me somewhere back in the early 90s. I was working in the tower. We Normally every year around the latter part of the year, you find that um, persons from Europe or everywhere, anywhere, they would just rent, say a group of maybe 18 people would rent nine aircraft and they would fly information. So there on that evening we had, I think it was about six aircraft going from Beef Island to St. Vincent. And interesting enough, Two of the aircraft had gotten into St. Vincent and the sun was just about to set. St. Vincent at the time, well, the old airport, Aga, not Argyle, but E.T. Joshua, you needed a night rating to go into there. So there are those other four aircraft in the Caribbean Sea and they're not too sure what they're supposed to do. We quickly just stepped in, guided all of them in. Unknown to me, a month and a half later, a fax is coming from the general manager of Slasper, who then was Harold Wilson. A, a, a flux was sent to by the pilots indicating how much they appreciated what we did for them that day because St. Lucia was not part of their plan and they had the best time in St. Lucia for that one nighter. We got them into hotels, we were able to just go into, I think at the time it was Club Med, we checked them in, we, we helped them out, they had no paperwork, we went to speak to Customs Immigration and at that point as far as I'm aware, customer service was not even something people were talking about back then. Mm -hmm. But when I think of it now, we actually did that, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those things that, you know, that comes with the job. Yes. Also on point for both of you, because um, what I'd like to add is that the, the flexibility that you need to have and the ability to multitask because of the fact that you need to be a person that can remain focused even when things are quiet. Because it's easy to look focus, lose focus and get bored as an, a human being when not too much is happening and as a matter of fact you'd figure uh, typically in terms of the research things happen in terms of incidents with air traffic control or in aviation when things are quiet generally so it is extremely important for to be a person who is flexible who knows how to adjust to situations and to know when it's down i need to keep my focus regardless because i could have an incident with one plane or two planes for that matter and then when the traffic builds up that I can adjust and raise my level to handle a whole set of traffic over a couple of hour period then re um, relax again but always be in focus every single time so, so do we have another question future of air traffic control St. Lucia okay I will start um, with that answer in the sense that 
I think literally, I suppose it goes down, the sky is the limit, in a sense. Um, air traffic control is going to evolve and it's going to become more automated and it's going to, but it, I don't think the human element will ever be taken away from air traffic control, no matter how, just like um, flying a plane, I think people at the end of the day will always want to know the comfort of a human that is behind all the technology, but it's going to expand in terms of we already seen and some of that technology will be coming to San Lucia very soon with a couple of projects that SLASPA is working on in terms of enhancing safety, in terms of enhancing efficiency and expedition. So you, you're going to have more and more tools in terms of what you could see that because you can see the aircraft, because a lot of what we do right now is procedural with some assistance of watching a radar screen, but not necessarily carrying out a radar function. So what you would need to do now, once you have that kind of um, facilitation in terms of um, technology, you can bring aircraft closer together and manage them more efficiently. So in terms of saving time, which of course saves money for operators and just makes everybody else in terms of the business aspect, because the airport, excuse me, is the window to the world. And, um, and also it is the gateway to reach all business um, that includes seaports as well, and Slasma is both, but this is uh, where tourism, and when you come talk about E-Trade right now, this is, this is it. So this is where we are going with the, I think, air cargo is going to get bigger and bigger, and I think we have to prepare and plan for that. And, um, but generally, technology is going to expand and expand, and, and the controller is just going to have information at their fingertips, just like the, the, the pilot in the cockpit. I don't know if you guys have any more to add. Yeah. As as a, an active controller in the tower, I think one of the things that I'm sort of looking at going forward is um, the proliferation of, I would say, unmanned aerial vehicles um, the point um, or the drones, point. Mm -hmm. and how they are going to coexist with the traffic, manned traffic. And uh, interestingly, I, I, based on the way things have gone in the world, we know that. It is unavoidable that um, these drones will have to coexist in a space with the traffic that we now control. Mm -hmm. And I know for now, St. Lucia, the Ministry of Civil Aviation has put out some guidelines for drone, op drone operators. I don't know that it's being followed um, necessarily by all drone operators on the island, but it is something we have to look forward look for going into the future. I was um, privy to a panel sometime last week, the World ATM Congress, and the Interestingly, the FAA, um, their position was that they wanted to take no action, either from the standpoint of a regulator or that of a uh, air navigation service provider that would um, sort of uh, stifle innovation in that field. So that means it's going to pose a, pose a challenge for, for mm -hmm. us as an air navigation service provider to respond to the, the rate at which the technology is, is moving and I know there are places where drones are used to go places where it's not safe mm -hmm. for yeah. humans to go so reasonably I think that's one of the things we have to look at going forward absolutely yeah, very the, good point Kendall the other aspect too as well um, in terms of development and technology there's also going to be a sort of a, a, a shift in that um, you may find areas where even control cabs may not necessarily be at an airport. Very true. So for example, you can have all the controllers down at Hironora controlling aircraft that are landing at George Shells. Mm -hmm. And that technology exists already. And it's been in tried, it's on trial now in certain places in Europe. Mm -hmm. And I, I was privy to seeing a simulator in Europe, in, in Hungary, and I can tell you it is fascinating because there are angles that even the human eye can't pick up. And, and, more, and more so, they are ultra sort of the, the infrared sorry cameras that can pick up what's happening inside of the aircraft even when it has landed in the control tower. So it was funny because I remember being there and we, we an aircraft had landed from I think it was from Dubai. It was a, an Emirates aircraft. And then we looked up, there were two areas, three areas that were hot on the aircraft. The nose wheel, the nose the nose wheel where the bricks were, and the cockpit where the two pilots were. So we, we, we sort of had a laugh about it because it actually can tell you everything that's going on and 
these are the kind of things that we have to expect going forward. So, and people have to be able to trust as well, because I know the same way. I mean, nobody wants to sort of have an unmanned aircraft in the sky with passengers. We hope it doesn't get to that. But in the same token, from a from a standpoint of controllers controlling from a remote area, because we actually do it right now in the sense that we control aircraft that we don't see. Absolutely. But now aircraft actually being able to land at an airport where the controller is not at the same exact um, mm -hmm. airport. These are things that we're going to see. Yeah. Absolutely. Actually, in order to sort of uh, ensure that the public has confidence in the, the yeah. systems, I, I think it's important to say that everything we do in a traffic control, there's always a redundancy. Yes, for there's sure. Always exactly. a, there's always a safe face measure. So any technology that comes about and it will be implemented as we expect that it will. It, it, Safety is always a priority. Of course. Safety mm -hmm. is always a priority. Mm -hmm. I, li I like that word, um, safety. And um, and in terms of, because I even want to touch on the, the fact that I don't think that, that, I'm sure there are persons in the general public who are wondering, okay, in the light of COVID, how are you guys managing in terms of the um, air traffic control? And because I, I suppose your planes are landing, people are, are coming into the country and people are leaving the country as the case may be. And um, I just want to assure the general public that um, the controllers, we took a collective. We sat down when COVID first happened in uh, March, and of course, uh, also using technology in terms of discussion, because Zoom is the in thing now, um, and, and the other teams and whatever you may use. But what we did was had, we had to come up with a situation in terms of a contingency, because uh, there are only 26 air traffic controllers in St. Lucia. We have um, five others who are trained, so we have a team of 31. But um, those persons had to be protected as well in terms of for the country, for aviation to flow and to continue efficiently and safely into the country. So what we have done and, that, and we have continued because we never let up because we knew that um, COVID was going to be with us for quite a while. So we have, uh, since um, end of March, we have created um, at both airports two teams of, of, of controllers who end up working shifts who never see each other. So they, have, uh, they, are broken, they, they work with the same persons in terms of each team that they work with all the time. And then, of course, there's a standby team in the event that something goes wrong with one shift. But the teams do not see each other because we want a situation where if something was to happen god forbid to one of our team members that the whole team is not affected so we still we have a fail safe to point kendall's point redundancy always that we keep so we have an a team and a b team at both airports and this and we had to structure even the times of operation of the airport to suit the, um, the, the functionality of that operation and um we will continue working this way as long as it's possible to do so um as we always operate under the guidance of the Ministry of Health and the Chief Medical Officer, but that is very important for the public to know that we have gone out of our way to ensure that we protect the continued business of um, aviation in St. Lucia, that we have protected our air traffic controllers' teams as far as possible. Yeah, I have colleagues who I have not seen since March, so I can speak to them. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yes, and it's, and it's something we had to do. So if we, if we communicate, we have to communicate via Zoom, via FaceTime, you know, WhatsApp, over the phone. But um, it is what it is. What it is. We are in a new normal, um, and it is going to last for a while. Yes. Um, are there any other questions from the public? What has been the most memorable experience in all of your stints as air traffic controllers? Most memorable. Most memorable. <laughs> most memorable. St um, stint. I had. Um, it was not necessarily a positive, but um, it was a memorable experience in terms of everything we have spoken about. Keeping your cool on the on the pressure, and it was an incident um, I had way back. I think it was maybe about 1996. I remember it like it is yesterday, and, and I'm sure my colleagues can tell you those moments you never forget. And it was a particular cargo, big cargo aircraft which used to operate into George Charles. And unfortunately, there was a small French aircraft, uh, a 
recreational aircraft, so to speak, um, pi private pilot who were, had, um, was supposed to be on his way to Viewfort, Yonora. Uh, so we um, were not aware that he was operating. And um, he, he made the error of coming into George Charles. So I remember it uh, where looking up, because, and that is so important for air traffic control. Air traffic control, you have to keep your eyes and ears. Not understand that you're talking to the planes, you must always have like, almost like a 360 visual of your airspace. And I remember looking up and seeing the, car, uh, the cargo plane, the big aircraft, and I'm seeing a plane below him. And I, uh, there was another private plane coming in, which I was speaking to. That plane was actually coming to St. Lucia. So I spoke to that plane, I said, uh, what are you doing in front of this plane? And he said, no, I'm not, it's not me. And then I realized, I looked across um, towards the College Hill, I saw the smaller plane. And I'm seeing this one, and then now, I am not in communication with, with this aircraft. And I have to inform the aircraft, first of all, they can, the big plane cannot simply just pull up. Because if he pulls up, the, the, the thrust will knock off the small plane, which is below him. So I have to inform him, as a matter of fact, I was working for a colleague, I happened to be the supervisor. So the, I took the microphone from the colleague and started working the traffic work because I would be accountable anyhow. And, um, and in terms of the experience, I had more experience. So the plane came down, kind of bumped on the ground and the, the pilots in the big plane, they were, they were former military guys. So they, they unflustered and they're, they're telling me, tell me when he stopped because they want to know what he's doing. And this guy, eventually, I'm trying to, to get him on the frequency. I tried all different frequencies but upon he was afraid, so he was not answering. So, but upon he was hearing me. And then he kept bumping up and down the runway. And then I had to wait until I felt that he had actually settled. And then I told the air, other aircraft, okay, you can pull up now. And I remember the other aircraft pulling up. It's an incident, but, and the other aircraft pulling up and um, passing right in front of, I was at George Charles, in front of the control tower. I could see the boxes of cargo. I could see the pilots. I could see the uh, the pilots had a red tie. <laughs> I remember it was so vivid, and the the aircraft pulled up, went went across, and the other guy eventually, we found out that um, he was totally lost. He was totally flustered and everything else, but it was the closest I'd ever come to a major incident, and I remember it being a surreal experience that I was working the control traffic. I was thinking at the same time about potentially the investigation, what would happen, but just going through it. And it is, I, it is an unbelievable experience, but you have to remain calm. And I remember the, 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 uh, um, the aircraft, the big aircraft that landed, I don't want to say the name, and then the pilots came across and they said, you know, hey, um, good job. So I said, you know, what's up? Uh, you know what I mean? And they said, that's no big deal, no big deal, no big deal. The military do that all the time. And I'm, my heart is in my foot. That was my experience, yeah. Can mm -hmm. Okay, so I, well for me, what I, one of the experiences I could remember was, uh, it wasn't as quite as dramatic as yours, mm -hmm. but um, I would say the first time JetBlue came to St. Lucia, um, I recall at the time at Iwanara, we had what we call the NDB approaches and the VR approaches. And JetBlue came in and he wanted to fly the RNAV or GPS mm -hmm. approach, which we did not have at the time. Mm -hmm. So that experience sort of, I remember the pilot came up to the tower and he explained why he wanted to do the GPS approach. And that experience sort of got me to a point where I understood more about aviation. So I was wondering why did this guy not carry the equipment to fly the NDB approach? But I understood that JetBlue's model as a low cost carrier was to keep the aircraft as light as possible. So mm -hmm. they wanted the GPS approach. That also led to development of ATC in Tenosha, because mm -hmm. eventually we did get the GPS approach at Iwanara and subsequently at George Charles. And now I could say most of the aircraft that actually come into Tenosha do fly uh, a GPS approach, which is, which is I guess, more cost effective yeah. for them. It lets them land a lot uh, quicker, the message uh, reduces holding times and that, that kind of stuff. So uh, JetBlue's first, or maiden voyage into St. Lucia was one of the uh, catalysts to me understanding more about aviation beyond just mm -hmm. air traffic control, more about the, the industry as well. Yeah, and, and not, not necessarily to put in a plug for JetBlue, yeah. but they actually were 
they worked with SLASPA in terms of the development of those approaches because if you have an aircraft that's going to be operating daily into St. Lucia and that's all they had in the aircraft. In fact, most of the time they would fly and they would fly and reach overhead what we call our, our navigational facility at the airport and then look out for the field. And the hope was that you would have a visual reference to the field to conduct the landing because if there was no visual reference, they had nothing else to do. So pretty much they eventually had to sort of expedite that um, development of, of our NAV approaches for, for St. Lucia. I mean, here in Aura being the first one. Um, I've had a number of experiences, but I, I remember one having one with a pilot, and it was sort of a, a, a pilot there, and it was a, a carrier. One afternoon we were working, and these guys coming along the West Coast, and normally the West Coast is very scenic, so most pilots, once the weather is nice, they want an opportunity to be able to get down to a low altitude, look at the pitons and things of that sort. So one pilot called in and he says, okay, St. Lucia approach, um, aircraft so, 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 we at X level requesting, um, will be requesting a visual approach. So I said to him, okay, descend to a certain altitude and call when you are ready for the visual approach. So a few minutes passed and I'm not hearing from the pilot. I was working with a colleague of mine. I, 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 said, to, I said to him, I guarantee you he has busted the level already, which means he has gone below the level that I assigned him. So I just calmly said, aircraft so and so, report your, report your level and position. And there was a 30 second <laughs> silence. <Yeah. laughs> so at that point, they like, they must be now communicating with the, I mean, speaking to the two of them in the cockpit. And he sort of said, he, and then, you know, he came across to say he was at 2,500 feet, just south of the pitons. He said, just continue report and final. When the aircraft landed, I told my colleague, okay, I bet you he's going to be in the tower within two minutes. <laughs> so said, so done. The guy comes up to the tower, very senior pilot, flying for in excess of 30 years at the time. He says to me, he just looked at me, shook his head, he says, you got me. This is the first time this ever happened to me in 30 years. It was a miscommunication between myself and my colleague, and I am so appreciative of the way you handle it. And the, the thing is, there was no reason for me to shout at him on the frequency, because there was no other aircraft in his area. But what he did was sort of a, a sort of a violation because he, he went through a level that he would not have. But what you think was it really was is that the guy had fallen in love with the Roman Catholic Church in Suazel, which is right <laughs> on the west coast. And for him, every opportunity he had whenever he was coming into St. Lucia, whether it's once a month, he wanted to be at an altitude where he could slow down that aircraft and allow the passengers to enjoy it. And since that time, he and I remain friends. Whenever he comes to St. Lucia, he comes up to see me. And I mean, this is the kind of you know camaraderie that yes. we, we have you know in, between pilot and, and, and controller. Of course, when it's not antagonistic. Yeah. <laughs> true. True. I should probably take the opportunity to say that um, I know a lot of people look at air traffic control as a stepping stone to becoming a pilot. But you know, air traffic management is a, a career on its own, and the best pilots I know were all from air traffic controllers. So I yes. think being a, a an air, air traffic controller builds your capacity to be a pilot. So, so, certainly. Certainly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I want to shout out the air traffic controllers in St. Lucia. In, um, it does come back to my mind again because I want to shout out to them because we are essential service. Maybe a lot of people don't know that we actually, by law, determined to be essential service. I, I'm not taking away anything from, of course, the police and the medical team and um, the fire service and the remarkable work they are doing right now. But I want to, to recognize the air traffic controllers team and, and a lot of also other staff at SLAS, but both at seaports and at airports who are out there working and um, doing what they're doing um, and, and may not be getting the recognition that I, I know some of us believe that we, um, we deserve, but continue plodding along. As a matter of fact, like I said earlier, the no news is good news. And so just keep on plodding along or whatever and to know that you are well thought of and the team I know from the general manager all the way down thinks highly of you and I think other persons out there appreciate it as well. But I just want to let the general public know that these are a team of persons who are out there functioning on the all kinds of circumstances, all the, the stresses that we are going through, as well as um, a country in this pandemic. And um, they are essential and they are doing well. Exactly, like 
good things and how much does it depend on I factor? Okay, so the question is, and Kendall, of course, I'm going to go to you on that <laughs> one. Uh, persons want to know what is the St. Lucia Traffic Controllers Association all about? What does that, um, that mean? Well, the St. Lucia Traffic Controllers Association, or SLACA, is a, it's a professional body that is committed to promoting professionalism. I think our tagline is professionalism, participation, and progress. So we are committed to pro promoting that in the, um, in the profession. So we are um, made up of air traffic controllers, former air traffic controllers, as well as, um, as we call our AIS officers and the aeronautical project, projects officers. Uh, formed in 1985, so we've been around for a while. Um, we were one of the, in fact, we were the first um, association in the Americas region. Yeah, there was the Americas um, conference. So yeah. yeah, we've been around for a while and I know we've been in the background, but our main goal is to promote prof professionalism in the, um, in the, in the, uh, in the field of air traffic control. And we're all generally employees of SLASPA. So our sort of engagement with the air navigation service provider happens at the level of employee employer. So there may not necessarily be a need for us to be out in the public, but certainly that, could, that is something we can look at going down the road so, um, to promote the, promote the profession. Yes. The Air Traffic Controllers Association has done some great things over the years. Again, air traffic controllers tend to be behind the scenes kind of person, so we are not out there. But I, also, they have done a lot of charitable um, works mm -hmm. in terms of support in the community as well as even when our sister um, islands have um, issues with hurricanes, um, the damage there or whatever, and we have um, risen to that occasion. So I know we don't um, toot our horn, we remain yeah. in the background, but this is also part of um, in terms of the, the charitable aspects for air traffic controllers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and to, to Kendall's point, being part of an international organization, you, you get the opportunity to interact and network mm -hmm. with a number of um, associations around the world, be it in the Americas region, the Asia Pacific, the African region, the European region, because we all have a, a story to tell and a story to share. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you, it is amazing sometimes that you go into a conference wherever, and you're having a discussion with a colleague and then you it just so happened that they're looking for a solution to a problem and the solution we have the solution because we have experienced it and likewise we have a we have a problem and need a solution so it's it's a, a sort of a, a fraternity so to speak of of colleagues who get together and and meet meet in a region on and on one hand and then you meet internationally so you, at any given point in time you could find yourself traveling all the way to Hong Kong or to Sydney in Australia to attend an international conference, you know. Unfortunately, not this year. But yeah. Yes. Yeah. Zoom. Yeah. And I Zoom. and I and I must say, I have over the years, I have been fortunate to be on the executive and and to have traveled to a number of of conferences, and sometimes it's even one where you don't even mind. I think the trip to Hong Kong, I I sort of part sponsored it myself because mm -hmm. it's very far to go but I, I figured it's an opportunity to see a country but as well to represent St. Lucia and I can tell you normally these conferences you need to have at least three persons because there are three committees an administrative a technical mm -hmm. and a professional committee and you must have a representative at each of those committees but unfortunately because it was so far to travel I was the only one so I was pretty much like on steroids moving from mm -hmm. one one committee meeting to the next trying to make sure I pick up as much information to get back and I remember this one afternoon a Thursday afternoon I was standing we were on a break and I stood there at two o'clock in the afternoon because of all the, the travel and the time changes and I literally just was falling asleep I mean I was just falling forward and I just told him no okay I need to go <laughs> and I went in I, I had like a five hour that maybe was one of the deepest naps I've ever had in my life you know I got rejuvenated and then I was ready to go because these conferences are like one week long so you you in meetings for the entire day and in the evening there's a lot of activity to, to take place so yes. it's it's you know, it's an experience certainly mm -hmm. so do we have any other questions okay. how has COVID impacted on your role as head traffic controllers? okay I think um, in terms of I said I think I spoke to some of that um, earlier in terms of the fact that we had to actually do um, a division of our workload in terms of the teams of air traffic control. Um, for a while, 
it was a, a situation where traffic wise we were only dealing with cargo and medical and authorized um, operations then we um, I think effective from July 9th we started dealing with um, St. Lucia opened officially and of course the other carriers started coming in so pretty much I, I think the air traffic controller um, remains a constant because pretty much that is what they do air traffic control and as um, now I would say because of the health facility which every island is um, and every country pretty much must have you have a situation now that where you have to manage limited parking space and um, limited slots and also many people having the addition now of having a medical process at the airport so I think going forward it is going to be very interesting and it will simply be not simply air traffic control but a lot of air traffic management because you would have to assess to see where do you where do you park whom I don't know what time so that because you have to get past it will have to be not simply about running um, um, controlling aircraft but controlling things on the ground in terms of passenger movement on the ground that you don't have overlap that you don't have conflicting uh, movements of passengers especially not simply because it is um, illegal by the International Civil Aviation Organization you must not have contamination of passengers in terms of crossing each other or communicating with each other but also from a health point of view um, now in terms of COVID so we're talking about safety we're talking about health and so air traffic control is going to get very interesting over the next few months as the traffic continues to build up and we see it coming and um, so it's going to be the new normal but we have to be on our toes and it's a situation where we may have to start managing um, not we've done it in the past but actually manage traffic from even the day before and plan for your traffic day ahead and plan for contingencies of suppose this one would have had that time and, and they came in a little bit later and who you bring in ahead it is going to be very interesting but in terms of the work it remains air traffic control and the teams are going to continue as long as we can in terms of keeping them separate because God forbid, like as I said, that we cannot have potentially a situation where if a controller is infected and then you pass it on to the rest, you need, because that means you, a, a, aviation in St. Lucia, there are no air traffic controllers. So, um, and people will have to go in quarantine and everything like that. So we are trying our best to keep a situation for St. Lucia where we continue the team approach until such time as the Ministry of Health says, you know what, there's a vaccine, we are over this hump. And um, so we're gonna do our best to do that and to provide the best and, and safest and most efficient service that we can provide. Mm -hmm. How has it been um, historically, in, uh, in your role as an interpreter, especially as a woman, and just developing in the field, um, what, how has it changed being a woman at air traffic controller then and being a, uh, in this management position oh. right now? Oh, uh, yeah, that's a very good question. When I came into air traffic control, I think, but I started off in the um, AIS office, which is the aeronautical information office, but we do the flight planning and everything else. And I remember shout out to Miss Kalindia Murray, um, who happened to be the first air traffic, female air traffic controller, I think, as a matter of fact, in the region. And I, um, that she became an air traffic controller in 1972. And I remember seeing Miss Murray in the control tower. But initially, when I first came in, I met the guys. And um, I felt that the job was a bit intimidated when I used to go up and visit. And then one day, I think she, she was at Uranora. She had been sent back down from Uranora <coughs> back to her original base, George Charles. I saw her in the control tower and I said, wow, you know, a woman can do this, you know. And so she was my biggest inspiration. Um, I think there was another female controller, Beverly at Uranor at the time, but Colindia was the one that I knew. And I said, um, I think I even said something to her and then, so yes, you can do it, you know? And from then on, I, I pursued it, um, went off to school to do air traffic control and it became my passion. It, um, I love, I love air traffic control. As a matter of fact, I, I, um, from the way I saw it, I could have remained an air traffic controller just in the control tower for the rest of my life. I love that job that much. And um, so I had no, th I was not thinking I'm becoming the administrative manager of air traffic control. I was not. But typically, 
um, that has been my lifespan. I end up doing stuff um, because it's, it's there and I do it whether I'm afraid to do it or not. So um, I believe in face your fear, so to speak. I thought that I was afraid of doing the job, but it was that I was not necessarily focused on doing that. Um, I was a union rep, I was all these things, all, all the time accidentally. And then um, eventually I came in, I think, um, to, to do a stint downtown at Slaspa. And um, afterwards I said, you know, this is not too bad. You know, although I missed the control tower, I didn't miss it. But then I found another way in terms of all the stuff I used to say when I was in the union and representing staff and, and all the things I believed in, it, that hadn't changed. And um, so now it was an opportunity as far as practical to make it better and to expand the team and to know that persons had to move up and persons had to be recognized. And um, because you know the hard work that goes into it because I was in it. So that has been my focus in terms of broadening air traffic control and um, broadening the scope for air traffic controllers, encouraging air traffic controllers to um, evolve into more stuff than they are doing right now. Like Kendall is a classic example of a person who has done a lot of stuff in terms of um, his, his degrees in aviation and everything else. And also to build a future because this is about a legacy and not staying, uh, staying there and saying, um, I'm holding on to this. I want to see persons come up with me. But the administrative of, uh, administration of air traffic control has been um, interesting, sometimes frustrating, but a wonderful, wonderful experience, which I will not ever um, see that. It was just my, my, my life path seems to have just been blessed. And I, I am one of those persons that found a feel that I actually absolutely love. So how is Slasper celebrating our, our HR controllers this year? Mm -hmm. Okay, and, um, as a matter of fact, um, I thought it was gonna be a low key year because of COVID and everything else. But I have to say thanks so much to the business development and corporate communications team of Slasper who um, approached us last month and said, hey, we, I suppose we were on the calendar for sure. And then of course the approach us in terms of having uh, air traffic controllers involved. And I know air traffic controllers gave testimonials of what ex individual experiences were like. We are doing this today. We also made some lovely um, cupcakes and planes on them for the air traffic controllers in terms of um, for that day, today. And um, we have messages from the general manager, from different persons of, and just uh, wishing controllers the best. It is still low key in a sense, and understanding the situation that we're in, but the fact is, I mean, it is more than I imagined to tell the truth when how 2020 was going. So I'm really appreciative to the business development department of SLASPA. You have another question? Yes. If we don't have any other questions, um, uh, let me maybe some, um, go in through th some final thoughts. Well, certainly, I mean, the journey within aviation for me has been, uh, it has been good to me, I, I must admit. I, I have been blessed, like you say, with the opportunities to be able to dabble into various fields. I am currently now doing sort of airside operations management, but I'm very much working on a daily basis in the air traffic control team. And I still consider myself an air traffic controller. Um, I do miss it, I, I must admit, I, I, I do miss it. But sometimes you you sort of have to move on to allow growth within within an organization and, and stuff like that. I mean, another thing that I, I can speak of that, you know, it just, it just came to my mind. Last year, I was fortunate to be in Europe. And I actually was at a university in Europe lecturing or giving sort of yeah i could say lecturing student pilots from europe and africa because apparently that university within that country has a flight school set up and they could not have found anybody to do the work a colleague of mine reached out to me and said would you be interested and so it you know there is this thing can take you to places that you never know 
we also find air traffic controllers, we work alongside the, the, the fire services in Zen Lucia. We do lectures with them all the time in terms of mm -hmm. airport familiarization, aircraft familiarization. These are things we do. So you as an individual just have to recognize how much scope there is and depending on what your your future thoughts are, your plans are, then you can, you know, move around and do whatever it is that you want to do. But there's so much in aviation that you can do and we have all had opportunities to do various programs, not necessarily air traffic control per se, but various other aviation programs and, and I've been fortunate to do that and I think I'm pretty much a well-rounded individual. I've had the opportunity to serve on the Air Transport Licensing Board in St. Lucia. So these are things that make you have different perspectives in terms of what aviation is all about in a country. And um, yeah, I'm just happy to have been invited um, today to be able to share my thoughts and with my colleagues. And you know, I, I like I always say, you know, I'm always willing and open to be able to share my experiences because back in the day when we worked, we had a lot less controllers on duty, so to speak, per shift. And you know, some of the tools that we now have at, this, at our disposal in modern day, we did not have it back then. Mm -hmm. It was challenging, but it was exciting. You know, just, and just to, just to add, I remember, I have one more story. I remember one evening we were working and then there was this controller from, Lo from London Heathrow. He came in on, a, he was leaving on a British Airways flight, so he came up to the tower. And in those days we had Liat 354 going up into Antigua, we had Caledonian, mm -hmm. British Airways. We, we, I think at the time we had about six aircraft working. And um, he stood in the background. It took us relatively about five minutes because in those days we never had GPS approaches. So everything, mm -hmm. everybody had to come over the airport. Right. So we, we got through it within five minutes. Then we turned back, we looked at him. And he went, oh. he said, no, 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 I can't do this. <laughs> because in those bigger countries, whilst they have a lot more traffic, they have a lot more processes. So aircraft already has a set profile to go into an airport without any issues whatsoever. So aircraft can come and go and not conflict. And sector control. Yeah. But with us, we did not have those things. So we had to rely on our procedural training. And it just goes to show you that you might think that you're in George Charles or Hironora and that somebody might say, but these guys are not busy. But every single airport has its own challenges. Never never underestimate you know what because you you may have a George Charles airport but they may have things about it that makes it very difficult to operate in and out of because of its proximity to here in Aura so that I'm saying all of this to say that you know these are some of the the, 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 the experiences that you have and you can safely say as an air traffic controller mm -hmm. you're good yeah can you? Um, I just want to say you know as I have indicated before that we are indeed professionals and um, as both Len and Amy has, have indicated, the job really builds your capacity. It builds your ability to be a better problem solver. It makes you more creative to solve, you know, unexpected situations. And so that is how both Amy and Len could have easily risen to the position that they are now. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I also want to take a moment to say to, to the members of Slack that on this day, uh, that we are, we, the executive was like, we're proud of you. Keep doing the good work that you're doing. Uh, we know it's been challenging, especially in these times, but um, we we know we know our value as a traffic controllers, and we will uh, celebrate you as soon as we can. But uh, unfortunately, we cannot be together because we want to preserve the integrity of the team structure to ensure that the country doesn't have to get shut down. So uh, yeah, I just want to say, enjoy your day. Yes. And we are with you uh, in spirit, and, and we thank you um, once again. Um, is, I want to say something also about air traffic controllers. We, have, we said all the, the beautiful things, but also what I've noticed, uh, consistency of air traffic controllers. We tend to become very impatient people because, yes. you, you see, decisions are made instantly. So sometimes when you transition, and that is, was, was an issue for me sometimes, when you transition into administration or whatever, you figure instant. But why are they taking so long? Make a decision, you know? Yeah. So you tend to, and you have to watch that in yourself um, to, to not be impatient with um, your family, impatient with others, because you're so accustomed to making decisions right away. So you don't understand the, the, the concept of waiting for things to, to happen. So all in all, we really appreciate the opportunity that we had today to share with you the general public and also our colleagues and other 
um, persons or aviation enthusiasts we, we believe out there. Um, we thank the air traffic controllers once again and we also thank uh, just from the airport community section that all the persons, I spoke about SLASP as, a, as an organization um, through this crisis, but there are many other persons on the airport, even on this controller day, that I want to say a special shout out to, and I'm talking about the security screeners, the customs and, and um, excise department. You're talking about the, the janitors at the airport, every, the airline employees. We're talking about immigration, emigration, all these departments that are there behind the scenes working and operating those airports um, and having things come through safely and taking care of the passengers. And our port health department, which has become a critical department to us at the airports. And of course, our fire service, who's also behind the scenes, mm -hmm. the fire service department. We all form the airport and make it happen. Thank you and happy Controller's Day to all.